Okay, we're live. Uh, welcome, everybody. Well, welcome, Karen and Rob, at this day. Thank you. Welcome, Kyle. Or at least the Sunday we're streaming live from the Sunday. Sorry. No. <laughs> How are you both today? Anything important, significant to report? Not really, just um, keep doing the actions for Assange. We went last Saturday to um, on a ferry yes. to Luna Park and um, under the bridge and near the Opera House and just trying to make people aware of the ongoing incarceration of Julian Assange and the travesty falling. And... Um, so we got to interact with a few people, which was very good. Yeah, I, I had the privilege of having dinner with Julian's dad, John, on um, Friday night. It might be okay. my birthday dinner, which yes. you were also invited yes. to, Karen, but couldn't come. And Rob was also invited to, but I appreciate can't, can't travel a <laughs> thousand miles. I didn't see the invitation. <laughs> Sorry? I didn't see the inv invitation. Well, it, it was taken as, well, given you're a thousand miles away, I thought it's probably <laughs> a little um, presumptuous to, yeah, I figured you couldn't come, brother, but um, okay. you would have been very welcome, both of you, of course, but um, Aaron's was a little, little more plausible, but also not possible. Anyway, John was with me, Julian's dad. And uh, just along with with members of the family, and um, it was really good to see him. And uh, Julian actually called while we were having dinner, and John stepped oh, wow. outside and took the call. So, and said he was, yeah. Um, he said Julian was in good health and spirits, which we're thankful for. Let's. Well, very good to hear. But yeah, we'll be more thankful when he gets out here. We want to bring him to this place, Absolutely. the Binacrombie. Yeah, yes. you, can, you can disappear in the bush. There. Well, unless he wants to be very public, but if he needs to um, uh, go somewhere where no one will be able to find him, we've got just the place. No, Julian and Sarge is how they're keeping the media quiet. So they want to keep the media quiet. So I don't think they'll let him go. That's my thoughts anyway. You don't, you don't think they'll let, let him go full stop? Well, there's no justice involved. Everyone knows there's no justice there. Um, no. It's clearly a criminal act by keeping him in jail. So they've got no... Re, um, so they're getting away with criminality as it is. So uh, while they can keep getting away with criminality, uh, so what he, he is a sign to the media, if you, if you tell the truth, we'll put you in jail. That's what he is. So they, want, I think they will keep him in jail just because I've got a very low, low uh, um, respect for the people in charge of all these things. Yeah, no, I, I hear you, but I, I take, the, I, I see a glimmer of hope for exactly the reason you see the darkness. In yeah. that, I think they've proved their point. I right. mean, I think their point, the powers that be, I think that was to make an example of him. That you know, if you question us, this, this is what will happen to you. It's a bit like crucifixion, as I've often I've got that picture Luke Cornish did for me, the graffiti image of the crucified Assange. And I think that's very pertinent because you know, the idea of a crucifixion was not simply an awful way of killing someone, but a way of making a public display of what would happen mm -hmm. to you if you opposed the empire. And I think that's what they've done with Julian, they've sort of hung him out for all to see. Now, having mm -hmm. said that, if they now go through and kill him. They'll just make a martyr of him. So I, th I think it's in their vested interests to um, see, be seen to be somehow merciful at this point by letting him go. Mm -hmm. That's my reading of it. I know oh, John I says right. these, people, uh, mm -hmm. these people don't You've got care. more hope than I have, Dave, Father. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've got hope they, for the worst of reason, Rob. <laughs> okay, yeah. So Exodus 24, 12 to 18. 
the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and wait there, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. So Moses sent out with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God to the elders he had said, wait here for us until we come to you again, for Aaron and her are with you. Whoever, are a, whoever has a dispute may go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day he called to Moses out of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Rob. What, what, what are your thoughts on this? Um... Yeah. So for this Moses passage... Going. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of things. Well, firstly, um, the, tab the tablets of the stone were written for their instruction, their being the people who were Moses was leading out of the... Um, of the wilderness yeah. I'm on. so 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 that gives us an idea that why those those tablets were written um and who to whom they were written to and uh and and the the last verse uh where moses spent uh, 40 <laughs> days and 40 nights uh you often wondered how anyone would know what happened in genesis 1 to 12 you know or one to twenty-two, pre-Moses, and um, it's uh, the, the Book of Genesis. Well, basically, he spent Moses spent forty days with with the Lord, so possibly Moses uh, was was shown all this while he was up on the mountain. Just an idea I had. Okay, you're going back to the original idea that Moses himself penned the entire uh, Torah, the the first yes. five books of the. Yeah. That's right. If he did, perhaps he discovered a lot of that up there. That's exactly. that a thought. That's the first I've heard that one, brother. I mean, it's interesting. We're not told what happened during that 30, 40 days and 40 nights. Well, mm -hmm. we're told what happens down the bottom of the mountain. The people go wild, don't they? And they start mm -hmm. building gods for themselves and uh, or get into all sorts of trouble. Mm -hmm. But in terms of what's happening between Moses and God, we don't. We're not given any insight, are we? No. It seems that there's a tradition that's grown up in Christian mysticism. You'd be familiar with that of unknowing. Mm. Moses walks into the cloud, mm -hmm. you know, with God and sort mm -hmm. of a mysterious encounter with God in the cloud, which is never described. Right. But which um, others believe we can tap into in a similar experience. Right. But, yeah, it's mysterious. The point is Moses has an experience, doesn't he? And, and in the end, we're told that Moses' face shone as well, didn't it? Reflecting the shining glory of God somehow in the cloud. So the whole thing is quite surreal. Well, it's also Any the thought? forty days is sorry. God, the forty days is significant because that's uh, the the forty days of the flood covering the earth. Type two. That's so the a good forty point. days is a significant time, and forty days of Jesus in the desert. So for, mm. that's a good point. For, for I, days, I thought that myself. Yeah. And I, I feel yeah, 40 days 40. Yeah, mm. was a significant time. And I feel it's most, in my idea, uh, I, I feel a God revealed Genesis to Moses in the mountain. That's just how I see it. It's interesting uh, the significance of numbers like 40, 12. You know, they, they come up a lot, mm. don't they, in the scriptures? I don't know what 40 days is. You know, I know when, when Jesus fasts for 40 days, 40 days is a long time to fast. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe it's seen as the sort of tolerable end of fasting. 
Well, there's a story uh, that came out last week of a of a pastor who decided to do the 40 days fast in the desert, and he died. He didn't make it through. Uh -huh. So, uh, so. <laughs> So, so yeah, it's not a small thing to to take part of. No. Forty days. Mm. It's it's a long time, and it's a it's long enough for all the Israelites down the bottom of the mountain to get themselves into trouble, isn't it? No, yeah. I think that's part of the point. Well, Cecily's made another important point. Forty uh, Cheryl rather, mm. uh, forty days of. Now, I assume the 40 days of Lent are built around the 40 days that Jesus spends in the wilderness. Is it, am I right? Probably. I know very little about Lent. I want to find out more. Yeah, so what can happen in... He spends 40 days with God. Maybe 40 days with God is a period of a life-changing experience. Mm. All right, I'll tell you what, we're, we're going to uh, leave the mystery, leave it there in this mystery, and I'm going to get, get the reading, um, the one Peter reading, or two Peter reading rather, uh, we're going to hit from Father Ola. I think you'll enjoy this. Just pray that uh, there aren't too many glitches in the transmission. I'll remove us and make it uh, broadcast a little more easily. Once I get it up. Hey. Yeah, so I'm back in Sweden, um, in Australia, but I'm um, more than happy to read the text. Yeah, it's from uh, the second letter of Peter, chapter 1. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor and glory from the God of the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying this is my son whom i love with him i am very pleased or he should say with him i'm well pleased we ourselves we heard the voice that came from heaven when we were with him on that sacred mountain we also have the prophetic message as something completely reliable and you will do well to pay attention to it as to a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. And that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, the human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Yeah, so this is a letter written by the, the Apostle Peter, one of of Jesus. Uh, and I think he's making three important points here. One, there is a lot of lies out there and false prophets, a lot of shallow philosophies, cleverly devised stories. This is not one of them. This is not a story. This is true. And this is experienced by Peter himself. Secondly, because it's true and not just the story, the scripture can be a light in a dark room. It can be a torch as we walk through the world. 
but and this is the third making sure i have the right number uh yeah the third point we have to remember that the script is not a work by the human mind entirely it's not the work of human effort only it is the voice of god spoken through humans through the human and that makes interpreting and understanding the bible a difficult but very important task in another letter in the new testament it says quote the letter kills but the spirit gives life and i think it's good to keep that quote in the back of your head when you read the bible the letter kills but the spirit gives life and what does that mean though i think it means that the bible if you only read it on the surface can be a very dangerous book it can be a book that literally kills and i think we've seen that too many times throughout history that's not the way you should read a holy text uh, and i think and i think i have good reasons to believe that when you read when you approach a holy text when you approach the bible you should do so ideally in a state of prayer with your soul open to what we could call the whispering guidance of the spirit yeah i think that's probably true that when you when you approach the bible you should do so in a spirit of of prayer in your souls as open as possible and that way i think that the bible will reveal its depth and its true meaning and also in that way reading the the scripture will a matter of mysticism anyway this is these are my thoughts on uh, this text uh, from peter i think it's uh, has some something to tell us uh, throughout the ages and what are your thoughts on this text i think that's uh, that's interesting to hear and what are your thoughts on the truths of the scripture you know the the divine and, and the human uh, and the divine through the human yeah, I'm checking out here and I'm wishing you a good day and I'm handing it over to Dave. Okay, there I am. <laughs> we'll stand for the gospel. The Holy Gospel is written in the 17th chapter of the Gospel of the Things of Matthew, beginning the first verse. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them and a voice from the cloud said, this is my son whom I, I love, with him I am well pleased, listen to him. 
When the disciples heard this, they fell down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. And uh, as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what you've seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. All right, I'm going to bring my other two friends in, Karen and uh, Rob. Just acknowledge, too, some uh, comments that have been coming up from our friends. Uh, going back to Cecily, they're not just about numbers. This is the 40, but about the experience of the living God. This is Moses. Indeed, you're right, and that's the focus uh, here in the in the gospel as well. Uh, then we had um, Patricia saying once upon a time, women needed to rest up to 40 days after childbirth. It's interesting, isn't it, the significant numbers that turn up, as I say, in, in the scriptures and all of life, 40, 12, I think 7, and 3. Um, now, Andrew's thrown something in here. Thank you for the insight, Father Ola, on how to read and understand the scriptures. I think Yes. I mean, I think Father Ola is picking up on the the mystical side of uh, the scripture, which is echoed, surely, if not today, then when? Thank you, Patricia. And, um, oh, yeah, okay. There you are. I missed this. <laughs> I missed the picture. Uh, too busy looking at Ola. Now, Sorry, we're in the Transfiguration. Have you guys got some thoughts? I shared mine in the newsletter this week. It's a story I've always struggled with. Maybe I'm just not mystically in tune enough. All, all the readings today are all connected and um, the, the thought of, of the truth shining light and um, the the actual witness showing by Peter showing that it was truthful, and then this uh, this reading with the the light it it all resonates with me. That it resonates with you in terms of your own experience. Well, in terms of the, I think just truth does bring light to us and makes us lighter in our spirit. And, and I just think um, the three readings today all connect and, yes. and I think show that truth does bring light and makes us lighter as well. In a spiritual way. Yes, I, I, you reminded me that uh, we were talking before about our campaigning for freedom of Julian Assange. When we first um, founded the WikiLeaks party many years ago, we were looking for an appropriate um, uh, you call catchphrase or, or whatever. Um, anyway, let there be light was one of the suggestions. <laughs> Um, yeah. which I actually thought would, would have been a great one. I think we went with truth is, truth is contagious or courage is contagious or something like that instead. But um, I yeah. thought let that was good as well. There, yeah. there is something yeah. surreal about the truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, going along with what Karen says, um, the, the Genesis, uh, was it Genesis? The Genesis, Exodus uh, reading brings into Moses's connection with God. And also mm -hmm. substantifies uh, the writings of Moses, uh, their veracity, um, and, because Moses spent 40 days with God. And so it's a, so he must have some, some special uh, uh, authority to write the, the, the Torah. And in the same way, um, the transfiguration, um, uh, Jesus speaks with Moses and he speaks with Elijah 
what that does for the disciples who were not far away, it, it connects Jesus to the Old Testament for the disciples. So, so, mm. so it's also a matter of authority. Yeah. Jesus showing his disciples that he has the authority to say what he's saying, to do what he's doing, and uh, it, it it also brings that God is, uh, especially to Peter, that uh, this is God doing this, and this is uh, something of great significance. And then we move to the Peter passage, um, and Peter talks about the authority of Scripture. Again, uh, we see the authority in there of that that the Spirit speaks through Scripture, and uh, and so all three readings today are talking about the authority of these of what we're reading to being how it is connected to God Himself, and 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 tightly uh, important for us to take notice of. Uh, not something for us to take lightly, as Father Ola said. We, you know, we need to not not um, we not not to just uh, look at the top, skim across the top, and that's dangerous. We need to dig deep into it, and uh, and then we will will it will bear fruit because we it's deep inside our soul. And I thought it was yes. great the way that Father Ola said. Uh, read the scriptures like you're in prayer and your spirit is reading the scriptures, not just reading the scriptures mm -hmm. as we would read a novel mm -hmm. or factual information just put before us. Mm -hmm. We need to read it in a spiritual manner. I thought that was a great way to describe it. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, I think, that that letter from Peter to Peter is probably written right at the end of his life. Mm. And he probably has an awareness at that stage of what's coming, mm. that he's going to be killed. And it's interesting, I think, at that point, what's he going? He latches back onto experiences that he can hold on to. And that experience of the transfiguration, the experience of seeing Jesus in, in that bizarre, surreal light, and hearing this voice, you know, being able to cling on to that. And I, I think, um, you know, often I think when I'm sort of feeling despairing, I, 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 I look back on deep spiritual experiences of the past, uh, be they alone with God or through other people, and I find I cling to those too. You know, so there's an interesting, a powerful combination today of both sort of the reality of human experience at a mystical level and also the authority of God that comes through um, those experiences. Now, I'm conscious of, I've been, uh, haven't been keeping up with the thread. I'm going to go right back to this one from Cecily and reading the Bible. It's about relationship with the Lord himself. This is the heart of mysticism, perfectly, yes, beautifully put. Yeah, beautifully put. Uh, trinket, some countries women work the fields, give birth, lunch, something. <coughs> yes, it is wrong. We don't want that on anybody. Uh, yes. Now, hang on, I've got another one here from Cecily. Didn't he have to wear a veil over his face? Yes, Moses, when he came down, because he... In the presence of the Holy God, and it was glowing so much with God's glory. That's right. I think the idea in Exodus was that it um, uh, terrified the people, uh, seeing Moses in that light. Though I think Paul comes up with a different interpretation of it in one of his letters, but uh, we won't go there right now. Trinket uh, says, uh, agreed, but I'm not sure what she was agreeing to, probably all of the above. Patricia says, does light have a beginning or an end? Is it not eternal? Always, always will be. In the passage, Moses and I to appear with the Lord, Lord's light, but in the end, you only see Jesus because he's the true light. This, we got to get you on here, Patricia. That's, this is powerful stuff.
hard to, hard to know what more to say after um uh, and then we've got what, what's Now, I, I've got to be honest and say, you know, my tradition, I, I haven't listened to the mystics enough. Um, you know, my, I'm from an evangelical background, and when, when we went to our good evangelical theological seminary, we didn't study any of the mystics. I and mean, you would have done better than me, I think, Rob. In your yeah, I spent a lot training. of time in the transfiguration. Uh, did a synoptic thesis on it, um, uh, comparing the, all the three gospels. How they, because it's in all three, all, all three, uh, syn like um, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, the mm -hmm. synoptic gospels, and uh, it's it's all really as um, as Cecily says, it's about showing that Christ is the one, that Moses and Elijah, they're just pointing to Christ, but Christ is the one who we. Who we must listen to. Yes, I mentioned in my newsletter this week that our Orthodox sisters and brothers seem to have a much better appreciation of the Transfiguration mm. than those of us than the Western Church. Mm. And really, you know, in some ways, from my understanding from my Orthodox uh, sisters and brothers, the Transfiguration almost is the goal of life. To be able to see Christ in Christ's glory, and to be able to share in that, you know, in some ways, if you've been to Orthodox services and you, they have the the screen and there's the mysterious things that go on behind the screen, and then there's people coming out the front of the screen, and the, it's it's similarly portrays that idea of the hidden realities that we're dealing with all the time that they're going on in the background, but we rarely. We get little glimpses. Mm. And this is, it's my, this is this the... Uh... My eldest was uh, baptised as a Greek Orthodox a couple of months ago. And um, and uh, and I, I noticed that the a lot of the service, the priest was doing stuff behind a veil. Yes. Mm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I think that's the thing. And I don't want to pretend to be an expert in Orthodox theology because I'm not. But it seems to me in an Orthodox service that where the action's happening really is just behind that veil. It's just hidden from us. Mm. You know, and that, that's that's the reality we're, we're, we're dealing with all the time, in a sense. Trink says, I agreed to Karen. I agree with Karen too. I'm not sure the mystics are fantastic. Cecily, we need to get you in here and share more about what the mystics have got to teach us. The others appear as we have glimpses. But we fail to hold the light continually. Exactly. What did Martin Buber say? You know, the thou is the eternal... The, the it is the eternal chrysalis, the thou, the eternal butterfly. These things are like butterflies. They they come for a moment and we lose them. But then in our memory, we go back to them when we need them. Yes, all the icons are very important. And I think the icons, in a sense, Cecily, reflect the same reality. You notice the icons, they're, they're never like um, graphic, like photographs, are they? They always picture people in a holy mystical light because that's the hidden reality which we fail to see most of the time. Mm. That the uh, transfigured reality, the ark was behind a veil. Yes, gosh, good point. Mm. I'm studying the mystics. We need to hear more from you, Cecily. That's the bottom line. All right, I think we need to draw it to a close. We're, we're hitting the... Um, We've done our half hour together. Hang on, though. There's one more. Uh, uh, no shadows in heaven. All right. Appropriately, I think we need to finish with some of the mystery left intact. There's more to the transfiguration than we're able to deal with in a half hour on a Sunday morning. Any... Closing thoughts, though, good people? 
I think, as you well, said, otherwise, Father we're... Dave, when, when we're feeling like we're in darkness, um, but there's light there and we just have to remember that and go back to the, the scripture and, and Christ and, and the light will make us lighter. I, I'm always uh, quite thankful that the disciples were asleep at the transfiguration, basically, because... Uh, it shows humanity. <laughs> We're asleep before what's going on, and we need to wake up to what's going on spiritually. Okay, that, that's a good point, isn't it? There are all sorts of amazing things going on mm. in the spiritual realm, but for the most part, we're asleep. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> A good note a good note to finish on or perhaps even a better one here courtesy of patricia light penetrates the dust and indeed the light continues to shine in the darkness as the uh, apostle john says and the darkness is never going to put it out mm. thanks be to god when peace like a river Attend my way when sorrows like sea billows roll. Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say. Well, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well. My soul, my sin, all the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part. But the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, all oh my soul. my soul.